This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk to a musician, artist, author, or other creative Mississippian working in the arts across the state. I'm your host, Melody Moody Thordis, Director of Grants at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm speaking with John Rusky, a musician, painter, and writer who is most known as a Mississippi River Guide and canoe builder living in Clarksdale. John, thanks so much for joining us on the Mississippi Arts Hour. Oh, great to be here, Melody. Thanks for having me. Oh, of course. So for people who may not know you, John, will you tell our listeners um, just a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a uh, Rocky Mountain uh, native who's got, uh, who's always loved water. Uh, Ever since I was a kid, I've looked for the sparkling, rippling reflections uh, off of the water and uh, forever uh, been been entranced by um, those reflections and by the water and, and the smells of the mud and and um, the, uh, uh, the willows probably are my favorite tree but alders also and reeds and the things that grow along the river and um, all the creatures that live along the river so even when I was growing up in the Colorado Rockies and later in the Great Plains, and later in the New Mexican desert, I was, I've was i always been attracted to uh, the water places. And eventually, I uh, made my way down the uh, waters, meandering across the Great Plains and into the Midwest, and down the mighty Mississippi, right down to the state of Mississippi, where I landed um, back in the... 80s and uh, so I'm dating myself after high school graduation my best friend and I built a raft and um, floated down the mighty Mississippi River and ended up as muddy refugees in on the first big island south of the Tennessee border uh, in the state of Mississippi when you leave Memphis you swirl around a big, big island, uh, President's Island, it's called, where the uh, behind which is the uh, <clears throat> the industrial harbor for the city of Memphis. And my first night in the state of Mississippi, I'd never been here before, was uh, as a refugee, uh, a, a muddy refu- muddy and wet and uh, hypothermic, actually, (laughs) a refugee on Cat Island, which is a giant island uh, in the northwestern corner of the state, I think in DeSoto County. I love that you walked us through that, John. So I'm curious if you could tell us a little bit more about growing up and what inspired you, what inspired you about the river, um, family trips, uh, and different things that you experienced as a young adult? My, I grew up in a, uh, in a neighborhood um, that bordered uh, Rapaho National Forest, um, up at about 8,500 feet in the uh, front range of the Colorado Rockies. And uh, I'm one uh, in a family of 10, including my parents, and um, so we were left on our own a lot, you know, the old, older kids taking care of younger kids. And uh, mom and dad had a lot, lot going on on their hands um, besides um, taking care of us. And um, so there was a lot of uh, hand-me-down and, uh, and oldsters watching over youngsters. And as one of the youngsters, it was my favorite thing was to uh, just disappear (laughs) and um, and get get uh, away from the house as fast as possible. And the best way to do that was to follow the creek bottom down to Cub Creek, uh, following tributaries of Cub Creek, um, 
down into Cub Creek, which is a rocky uh, spring-fed watershed that drains a, uh, a big area below um, Spruce Mountain and Bear Mountain and uh, eventually runs into Bear Creek, which drains the 14,000-foot uh, um, Mount Evans, which is the big mountain you see when you're standing at the, uh, on the steps of the Colorado State Capitol and you look west. Um, and there's a, uh, often covered in snow, there's a 14,000-foot peak that rises uh, almost due west of the Colorado State Capitol. And, um, but my family, uh, in addition to that, um, was outdoor oriented and, and my parents, um, uh, partly out of economic, uh, uh, need, um, took us, uh, on a lot of picnics and outdoor trips and, one of our favorite things to do is just go uh, go as a family and picnic down on uh, on uh, Evergreen Lake, which is a nearby mountain lake, or uh, along a sandbar or a gravel bar on on uh, on Bear Creek. And when we took family vacations, um, my parents would load us all all eight of us into a Ford Econoline van. It was not a 15-passenger van. It was one of those kind of squat-looking vans, painted green, hmm. kind of a Kelly green, um, full of uh, pads and sleeping bags. And uh, we'd all just pile in the back of this van. And my parents, uh, my father especially, loved, my, my mother, you know, it was, uh, I think, kind of a, a hairy trip for her. But my father loved the, the, the adventure, kind of a romantic, uh, and he loved adventure and, and loved taking all the kids out and, and, uh, and just going, not knowing where you're going to go, where you're going to end up at the end of the day. Um, kind of like, you know, a, a, a beatnik or something, you know, a on the road kind of trip, family trip. <laughs> But for my mother now, she had to wipe all our noses and, you know, find food. And, and it wasn't the same romantic experience for her, although she enjoyed certain parts of it. But it, it was, uh, you know, uh, and we would end up at the end of the day in, um, in National Forest or, or BLM land, just pulling off the side of the road and following a dirt road and, um, and, um, and, and uh, camping just wherever we could find it. And in some ways, John, you know, it seems like you're still doing that, you know, finding the camp where you can. Well, um, I know you're a musician, so could you tell us a little bit about um, your experience in that realm? Well, my mother um, uh, 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 taught me to play piano. She, she was an uh, opera and play, played... Uh, piano, classical piano, and sang opera, um, and was on, on the pathway to becoming a nun when she met my father. Wow. And, um, and she taught me to play piano uh, by ear, not, not by, uh, by note reading. And um, we've always had music in, in our household. My older sister, Abby, she taught me to play guitar, and and my older brother Ernie, I think, taught Abby how to play guitar. And um, and then later in high school, I started playing in mandolin. I taught myself that. I'm kind of a self-taught musician, besides what my mother uh, um, uh, taught me, sitting on the piano bench as a as a five-year-old uh, snotty-nosed kid, and. Um, but the songs that she sang are still some of my favorite songs. The Stephen Foster songbook was one of her favorites, and things like uh, "Blue Tail Fly" and um, and um, and American folk classics, you know, like uh, "Pa Pa Patch," 
You know, oh, where, oh, where's dear little Johnny? Where, oh, where's dear little Johnny? Where, oh, where's dear little Johnny? Way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Come on, boys, let's go find him. Come on, girls, let's go find him. Come on, family, let's go find him. Way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. Picking up pawpaws, put him in his pocket. Picking up pawpaws, put him in his pocket. Picking up pawpaws, put him in his pocket. Way down yonder in the pawpaw patch. And she would play that with all of us, all eight of us around the piano and, and the young, young ones sitting on the piano bench. And those are still some of the most striking memories of my childhood. And um, we had no idea, I'd, or I didn't anyways, what a papa was. It was just a neat sounding <laughs> word, you know. <laughs> and now, decades later, I, I, I've, I've learned uh, directly what the fruit is uh, because we see it out in the forest, the floodplain woods of the lower Mississippi River and um, there was actually a guy who came to us, a uh, pawpaw specialist who wrote a book uh, called the Pawpaw Book and, um, and we guided him a couple years ago out to, uh, to a location we know where pawpaws thrive. Oh, nice. America's largest fruit, and, and they, they do well in the uh, floodplain forest of the lower Mississippi. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Ryder Taff, Portfolio Manager at New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advisory and co-host of Money Talks. Each week, we take your personal finance questions and tell you about a money topic we hope you find helpful. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. Each week on the Arts Hour, representatives from the Mississippi Arts Commission speak with different creative Mississippians. Today, I'm speaking with canoe builder and owner of Quapaw Canoe Company, John Rusky. So, John, before the break, we were talking about your childhood and growing up in nature and your love for such things. And I'm curious to ask you a little bit about your time at the Delta Blues Museum. Um, I know that you served for a time as curator there. So for our listeners, could you tell us a little bit more about the museum and your time there? Well, the Delta Blues Museum was started in 1979 by uh, Sid Graves, who was a visionary uh, library director because it started as a um, division of the Carnegie Public Library in Clarksville. And, uh, and Sid and the Board of Trustees um, um, recognized the uh, need for uh, an institution like a museum to recognize and preserve and protect the, uh, the uh, rich history of the blues and what, no better place than, than uh, perhaps the very center of the blues world, uh, and arguably. And, and definitely one of the mm -hmm. most important uh, locations for Delta Blues, and that is in Clarksdale. And um, I returned to uh, Mississippi after that raft trip, that fateful raft trip in, uh, in the 80s, about 10 years later, um, with a guitar in my hand and an accordion. And... Um, ended up uh, volunteering at the Delta Blues Museum under Sid's direction and the, and the librarians who kept the, libra who kept the museum open and um, as a volunteer uh, in the winter of 1991 and, um, and when uh, and, and when the um, and 
and kind of grew into becoming the first employee, first as a docent, showing people around uh, that had never had an employee before, hmm. and, um, and then as curator. Um, when uh, um, the, the need became apparent that, uh, uh, for, for building exhibits and uh, creating a system for archiving, um, the uh, uh, guitars and, and, uh, and musical instruments and paperwork and photographs and works of art and everything else that the museum had been collecting for decades, but no one had ever systematically um, um, archived and created exhibits and, and public uh, uh, interaction through. And um, I thought I had found... Um, my heaven on earth in, a, in, a, in the early 90s, working with Sid, who, who just a fantastic, a genius kind of person with a, a photographic memory and a, a zeal for life and literature and, um, and music. Um, he, he wasn't a juke joint. He, he wasn't a guy to go hang out in juke joints. He didn't play a musical instrument, as far as I know. And... Um, Kind of, kind of, probably self-described nerdy kind of person, but he had a unquenchable zeal for life and, and a great storyteller, and uh, to this day is one of the most influential people in my life. Well, I know that you mentioned that you knew Jesse May Hemphill, a famous musician, who are live recording listeners will hear during the break. So, tell me a little bit about that relationship and what it was like um, getting to know Jessie May. Yeah, Jessie kind of took me under her wing um, uh, 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 as, a, as a youngster. Uh, uh, I, I think she looked, looked upon me as, as like, a, like someone who needed help or, uh, or maybe a, a, a child or, or something. She, uh, she she uh, uh, um, spoiled me kind of with a, a motherly kind of attention, um, uh, cooking for me and and uh, and uh, opening her house to me when when um, when uh, I just need to get away from Clarksdale. Um, I used to go up and visit her and stay at her place up up near Como and um, up near Sanitobia. And, um, and uh, she is one of my all-time favorite musicians. Uh, her, her tonal quality and the rich, um, flowing continuity of her style of blues is so rich and, and, uh, um, and vibrant and... Uh, has this continuity to it that that very few musicians are able to achieve, and um, but it, I, I remember her f forever. Uh, I, I hear her her voice right now as we're speaking, kind of a squeaky, uh, childlike voice. When when she was talking, that is not when she's saying, but when she's talking and uh, and. Uh, and the greens and, and uh, sweet potatoes that she cooked in her kitchen and fed me uh, a, a, a dumb kid in Clarksdale who she kind of uh, put, put under her wing. <laughs> well, John, I know that you've done some extensive writing on the oral traditions in the contemporary blues of Mississippi, and I know that it's very important to you to keep up with traditionality and how that works and passing down um, certain traditions and oral histories. And I'd love to hear more about why that's important to you, why that's a passion of yours, and how you've seen that play out in your work. Yeah, definitely. Well, Johnny Billington uh, became uh, my mentor in learning, and I'm talking about Johnny Billington, <clears throat> Mr. Johnny, who um, was a Clarksdale uh, a guitar player, um, who taught kids how to play play the blues, and and was the uh, 
the model for what you now see at the Delta Blues Museum in their arts and education program. And Mr. Johnny, I, I spent a couple of years studying guitar with him. Uh, although he took, he put me on the drums and then the keyboards and and, and guitar. Even though I wanted to learn guitar, um, he's an old style kind of uh, of, uh, of mentor uh, who who uh, broke everything down to the basics and uh, taught the hard lessons of life and taught them the hard way. That probably how he learned them himself but in a way that um, I and all of the dozens of other people that, that uh, he led directly to their musical careers. I, I never made a musical career out of it, but um, people like Arthur Jones, um, the Gas Man, and um, Anthony Sherrard, Big A, who's, who's now one of the top performers in the state of uh, Mississippi, one of the top blues performers, and... Um, Big T, Terry Williams, and uh, Billy Gibbons, uh, who some people call the Prince of Beale Street, um, was one of Mr. Johnny's students at one time, and um, and even Kingfish, uh, Christone uh, 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 Ingram, he he, uh, Mr. Johnny, I don't think directly taught him, but he was taught by others who were taught by Mr. Johnny. So there's this multi generational tradition that that uh, is carried on, and Mr. Johnny uh, uh, he cited Sonny Boy Williamson and listening to the King Biscuit Blues uh, program from uh, KFFA in Helena. And what one of the things that Mr. Johnny influenced me with um, was the. Uh, that kind of knowledge that comes through doing something that's of value to your community and um, the, nothing's more important to the Clarksdale communities than its music and the blues is the vernacular. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of music you listen to today, the blues is in it somehow. And um, I, I was able to use uh, Mr. Johnny's method in um, teaching uh, canoe carving, uh, the art of uh, carving a, uh, a dugout canoe out of a log and, um, and then later paddling that canoe and, and the skills that are involved in, in uh, surviving and taking care of yourself on islands in wilderness uh, uh, situations on the islands of the Lower Mississippi River. My experience with Mr. Johnny opened up uh, a, uh, the world of, of sharing and passing on uh, traditions um, person to person and the, uh, the ability to, to do that and the, uh, and the importance of doing that. Well, you've certainly done a lot of work to pass things on uh, to the people you come in contact with. I know that you work with a lot of young students, and you have an apprenticeship program working with young people, teaching them how to build canoes and camp and serve as river guides. So tell me a little bit about um, your your time doing that and, and why it's important to you. Yeah, Mr. Johnny said, if, if you don't share uh, what, what you know with the kids around you, then it's going to die when you die. Mm. And, um, and just like music, um, uh, carving canoes, the, the swinging of, of sharp, shiny objects uh, through the air, and the sound that they make when they hit that solid wood, it's like a drum beat kind of reverberates through the town, up and down the streets. And um, water, of course, is one of the biggest things that all of us are attracted to. But even more so, if you're a kid, you're, you're going to want to get to water. And in the mud and in the sand. And, um, and then fire is the other great, great attractor. And... Um, um, and just like music, you know, mu uh, m music uh, uh, is like the, you know, it's like the Pied Piper, you know, it, it, 
if you hear music, uh, kids are going to follow it. So there was this natural, um, natural attraction that, um, that uh, uh, brought the um, canoe building to life. Because when I started carving canoes, and I, I, it was, when I started doing it, I was a student myself. I was just learning how to do it. And a, uh, a, a guy up on the shores of Lake Michigan uh, named Ralph Rees, a master canoe builder, he, um, he taught me the, uh, the method for building uh, uh, Voyager-style canoes and turned me on to um, dugout canoes. And, and um, I discovered a, a, a whole world. There's, not, there's no books written about dugout canoes it's, or how to build a dugout canoe. And very pe few people practice a tradition anywhere in, in uh, North America. Although on the West Coast, it's more, more, you might find a few people. But in the Southeast especially, there's, I don't know of anyone who's, who's carving dugout canoes. And, and yet, it, our, our, uh, the history of the Southeast and the hundreds of thousands of Native people who lived here is, uh, would not be possible, uh, the, the richness of that culture of the Mississippian people I'm talking about, the people that, that uh, DeSoto, he was the first white guy to describe them in his journals. And, and, and it's an interesting story, actually, when, and, and this is written in his journals, when DeSoto came to the banks of the river, he was met by an armada of, of Native people, Mississippians, the original Mississippians we're talking about here, the mound builders. And, and every day, his journals say the, uh, an armada of warriors, um, two to 3,000 strong, would paddle by in canoes on the, on the Mississippi River where, where DeSoto and his men were fearfully camped and trying to get out of by building their own raft. They didn't know how to build canoes. They were building a raft to get across the river. And um, the, the, uh, every day is a show of force. These thousands of native uh, Mississippians um, peppered the, uh, the, the, the tiny Spanish army with arrows, and they say that those canoes that they were in, that there was 60 to 80 warriors per canoe. Wow. And the canoes that we build are 29 feet long. The biggest canoes that we build in Clarksdale are 29 feet long. And a 29-foot canoe maximum can hold 14 people. And usually we only have 10 people in a 29-footer. So try to imagine a canoe that can hold 60 to 80 people. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably 50 to 60 feet long, which, um, you know, they were the freighters, they were the school buses, they were the, the, the minivans and the suburbans of that culture. <laughs> <laughs> That's and right. We know <clears throat> by the example of other cultures around the world that still practice a canoe building tradition like the Haida Gwaii of, uh, of British Columbia. And, um, and it's probably a 50 to 60 foot long canoe, uh, six to seven, maybe eight feet wide in its, in its beam, which is the center of a vessel. And, and after you can imagine that, then imagine the size of the tree that it took. <laughs> and that is alone is a testament to the biota of the Lower Mississippi Valley, which hundreds of years later, Teddy Roosevelt, who was a bear hunter, came to the Delta and he said the biggest trees that he saw in North America were in the Mississippi Delta. The giant uh, cypress and, and sweet gum and other trees that grew in the uh, alluvial floodplain of the Lower Mississippi, they were, he said they were the biggest trees that he saw outside of the West Coast, that is in uh, North America, and we're talking uh, trees 10 to 12 feet in diameter at their base and, and reaching up to the sky over 150 feet tall. 
Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. If you ever miss one of our locally produced shows or want to simply hear it again, you can find what you need at mpbonline.org or download our podcast app to your smartphone. MPB programming is on your schedule at mpbonline.org. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Melody Moody Thordis, Director of Grants at the Mississippi Arts Commission. If you're just joining us, today I'm speaking with canoe builder and river guide, John Ruskey. So John, before the break, we were talking a little bit about your work to make dugout canoes. So I'm curious, um, Could you describe the process a little bit more uh, and what it means to dig a dugout canoe? Well, thanks, Melody. It is a uh, it's a spiritual journey and it's a uh, a long physical journey. It's uh, it's as long as paddling the length of the Mississippi River. The, The people I've built one dugout canoe by myself. And um, I'll never do that again. Since then, I've been part of dozens of dugout canoe projects that involve many people and, and often become community carving projects because it is something that you want to share. Um, it's like a, a, a community garden or something. And um, it's a, 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 a a big physical undertaking. It involves a lot of uh, manual labor, um, but it's something you, you you have to approach uh, respectfully and um, and artistically and spiritually. And um, this is highlighted by a ancient tradition amongst canoe carvers. That um, involves um, spiritual preparation, um, including abstinence and um, and fasting and um, other um, religious or or spiritual practices that help um, the the canoe carver focus and. Um, clear his or her mind from the clutter that, that fills our lives and opens your imagination to the, um, the ways of water and um, fluid motion and flowing forms. And um, the canoe necessarily by its function involves um, flowing forms, not only by the by the, the way that, that the grains of wood uh, flow through a tree, and then f- um, the way that um, you carve, uh, you move your your hand plane or your um, or or your chop with your adzes and axes in in um, harmony with the with those flowing lines that are the texture and the substance of the wood. Um, But also, and perhaps more importantly so, in the future of that vessel is the way that it is going to cut the water um, when you finish your canoe carving and set it in a uh, stream or river or lake or or the Mississippi River or the Gulf of Mexico. that vessel that you are carving is both a, uh, a, a an artistic uh, object, but it's also a functional object. 
and um, to do to the, its success depends on the balance achieved, and even more importantly, so the the um, the way that the wood has been carved on its exterior side, uh, that is, um, to cut the water and then to and then to flow through the water and then to allow the water to come back together at its tail. So I often tell my, my uh, canoe carvers, my apprentices or the people that I'm carving with to think like a fish. Hmm. And, and canoes often end up looking like fishes. They have pointed noses and they have sharp ends. And in a canoe, um, um, the, uh, the shape is symmetrical, um, fore and aft and, and, uh, and side to side, uh, port to starboard to use nautical terms. Mm. And, um, you know, like a Grumman canoe or, or a plastic old town canoe or almost any canoe that you buy uh, commercially is going to be uh, mathematically symmetric. And a dugout canoe, you have a lot more latitude. Um, but you, in, in the back of your mind, always symmetry is one of the, one of the guiding principles because it, uh, it, it um, creates balance. And being on the water is all about balance, unless... You know, you just want to get wet. <laughs> so I'm curious, John, when you go about this process, what kind of wood are you using? Are you choosing the same kind of tree over and over, or are you choosing different trees, and why? It's a uh, conversation, for sure. Mm. Uh, and um, that starts with the uh, selection of the tree that, that you're going to use for the, uh, the canoe. Uh, if you are so lucky, you can walk in your own backyard and, and maybe you've developed a relationship with a particular pine tree or magnolia or uh, cottonwood or cypress, which are our most our favorite uh, types of woods to use. Cottonwoods, they, they grow f fast and, and are easy to find anywhere around the state. In Cyprus, uh, a little less so, you know, you, you got to live in the right right uh, parts of the county to find Cyprus. It doesn't grow as, as uh, commonly as it used to, but it is perhaps the best w wood uh, in the southeast to use. In, in the western states, um, western red cedar is the favorite wood amongst canoe builders. But in the south, I'd, I'd have to say uh, Louisiana bald cypress is the best wood. But regardless, um, the um, everything has a spirit in it, and um, it's the the, uh, the the first challenge for the canoe carver is to to find the uh, right tree um, for the journey ahead. And, um, you know, there's certain physical attributes that you need to look for. Uh, a uh, long uh, clean of, of, uh, of uh, branches, big branches or uh, forks in the wood. You, you know, you want a long section of trunk, um, at least three feet wide, and um, four feet is even better. And, and that is in diameter. But most importantly is the uh, is the feeling you get from from uh, any particular tree, whether it be dead or alive. It, it, there's a spirit that is contained, that is living, uh, I should say, in, in that um, in that uh, 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 tree trunk, and its and its uh, and its uh, forks and its branches and its crown of of uh, branches. That reach up into the sky, and uh, the trees are like the bronchia of the uh, of the earth. There are they're the lungs. They're, they're the uh, they're the the ones that allow us to breathe because they create oxygen, and in turn, they um, they uh, uh, each one has 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 a has a uh, its own unique character and spirit and anyone who's spent any time 
near near in in the woods knows exactly what I'm talking about. Well, we found that as canoe carvers, that that spirit stays with the the wood even after you drop a tree and cut it up into a twenty foot section that is usable for for a canoe carving project. And we know this because we we um, come back to that um, that log that is now sitting on the ground in your canoe carving area uh, day after day for weeks on end and sometimes months and um, and sit quietly with our sketchbooks or our journals or maybe just in uh, prayerful meditation and certain feelings uh, um, uh, images or smells or, or memories um, come dancing through your imagination and if you allow your pencil to flow freely on your page um, you're going to find something that is striking about that log that came out from that tree that um, catches your attention again and again and um, and then, and then if you ask other people to do it, and we do this with groups of school kids and, um, and adults alike, but kids, you know, have a special kind of fluidity in their imaginations. And they find that the same thing. They find, they find uh, that there are, is something um, living within that tree that um, they see and, and express on the piece of paper they have in front of them. And, um, and then sometimes we discover that we're seeing the same thing. And, um, and that's the way that the, uh, we, we uh, discover the, the spirit in the log is what we call it. And we're actually doing that right now in downtown Clarksdale with a cypress tree that we dropped along the banks of the Sunflower River, not far from Quapaw Canoe Company. And um, we're looking for the spirit within the log and um, and um, and it's the 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 uh, and it's a community thing because the the um, the spirit that's true it's kind of like the naming of a of a of a vessel the the name that or or a nickname uh, is a good example you know like a nickname for a person that the nickname that works is the nickname that holds, you know, the nickname that mm. sticks. The, 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 the true nickname is the one that sticks. And, um, and uh, we find the same thing with, the, with our canoes. It, the true spirit is the one that everyone looks at and says, oh, yeah, you're right. Or, you know, they just, they have a feeling that that is a frog. Or, you're right, look, I see that, that blue heron in there. Or, or dragonfly is another one. And, and um, and um, so it's it's uh, we're we're tapping into the um, universal um, subconscious um, psyche that's flowing and forever flowing um, uh, that that all artists tap into. Um, but as canoe builders, it involves many hands and many. Uh, Many, many uh, minds all coming together in, in, in some kind of a, of a harmony, uh, kind of like a, a barn building. And, um, and that uh, uh, ever flowing um, stream of the subconscious uh, becomes apparent um, in, the, in this practice. And um, once we uh, discover that, then it's time to sharpen the tools, axes and adzes and, and scorps and, and uh, hand planes and, um, and uh, elaborate that, that uh, um, spirit out of the, uh, the shavings of wood that you carve from that, uh, vessel, from that tree and make a, uh, a functional vessel. Well, John, as we wrap up our conversation today, can you tell um, our listeners out there where they can find out more about Quapaw Canoe Company and the work that you're doing in Clarksdale? 
Well, Quapa has a website at uh, island63.com, and um, um, there are there's artwork and maps and a lot of descriptions on it. But you can also go to a thing called the Quapa Dispatch, and that is a newsletter that I've been writing for the past 20 years, and um, you can read uh, about our adventures on the river and see photos of the canoes that we have built and are working on um, in that uh, dispatch. Hi, I'm Melody Moody Thordis, and you're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast. You can also hear the show on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. To hear all our conversations with creative Mississippians, be sure to subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast on your favorite podcasting app. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org.